It happened so fast. All-American Iowa boy Johnny Gosh was plucked off of this otherwise normal residential sidewalk before he could even begin his paper route. It was early and still dark, but several witnesses, most of them children, saw Johnny in those early morning minutes before he disappeared. Despite their eyewitness reports and the quick alerts to his disappearance, very little evidence of Johnny's whereabouts remained. And with very few clues, authorities had very little to go on. The story of Johnny Gosh is a whodunit filled with unknowns and conjecture. It spans years and years of hope, hoaxes, and false leads. It's also an epic tale of ambition and conflict. Johnny's two strong-willed parents argued publicly with law enforcement and fought to change the course of policy and police procedure. No one should have to wait 72 hours before a child is reported missing. But what had happened could not be undone. And after all this time and all the unknowns and deception, will anyone ever really know what happened that day? Early in the morning, on Sunday, September 5th, 1982, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh got out of bed to begin his Sunday paper route. Johnny was described as friendly and determined. He liked being outdoors, he liked building rockets, listening to music, and playing the drums. He was a considerate child, sometimes bringing home flowers for his mother. He had one of those cool chairs that looked like the palm of a hand and a Yamaha dirt bike that he bought with money he earned on his paper route. Like most 12 going on 13 year olds, Johnny was expanding his independence. The night before, while going to bed, he had asked, can I do my paper route alone in the morning? And following some discussion, ultimately was turned down. Since taking the job delivering the Des Moines Register and Tribune nearly a year before, Johnny's father had always assisted him on Sunday mornings. However, that next morning, Johnny woke up and perhaps feeling particularly grown up or mature, decided against his parents' wishes and chose to deliver the papers all alone on his own that day. Johnny's older half-brother Joe woke him up that morning. The Gosh brothers, responsible youth that they are, both needed to be up early on this holiday weekend to work. Joe gets up first and knocks on his little brother's door. You up? He asks. Yes, is Johnny's reply. Without even seeing his little brother behind that door one last time, Joe gets on his motorcycle and leaves the house for his job at the Village Inn, a national breakfast chain. It's about 5.30. Johnny gets up and gets dressed. He puts on black soft pants and a white sweatshirt. In black lettering, the words Kim's Academy are printed across the back, and it declares his association with the local Taekwondo Martial Arts School. He does not wake his father. He slips on his blue sandals, grabs his red wagon, and heads toward the door. Johnny leaves his home, bringing his dog Gretchen with him. Instead of taking the sidewalk and walking all the way around the block the way we came, he takes a shortcut through his neighbor's yard. This was a common occurrence, and his neighbor, Lawrence Headland of 1001 45th Street, is not at all surprised to hear the sound of Johnny walking by with his wagon and his dog at about 5.50 in the morning. Of course, this route would not be possible today. Today, we have this huge fence. Now, I personally was a 12-year-old fence jumper, and maybe Johnny was too, but we know he wasn't jumping this fence that morning. He had his wagon and his dog. His short little Dotson wiener dog, Gretchen, was not a fence jumper. So based on Mr. Headland's account, this fence was not here back then, and Johnny was able to walk straight from his home to this sidewalk here on Ashworth. He's walking this way to the newspaper drop. It's Sunday morning, and on Sundays, he has a big pile of papers to roll and to deliver. 
but it's also Labor Day weekend, and so today he has big plans to meet up with his best friend for a trip to the lake after his route is complete. The weather is going to be perfect for a day on the water. Already at 6 a.m., it's 69 degrees with a slight breeze. This early in the morning, the streets are mostly empty. The next person to encounter Johnny is another paperboy, also out preparing to do his route. His name is Mike. Mike reports to authorities that while heading down Ashworth, a car pulls over and the driver appears to speak with Johnny. The man is lost and looking for directions to 86th Street. The car is described as a two-toned blue Ford Fairmont and at least one other witness believed that they may have seen it in the area up to 30 minutes prior. So the driver was either definitely lost or perhaps waiting for Johnny. If so, their cover story is a believable one because 86th Street is a popular numbered street in nearby Clive, Iowa. It's a busy commercial road, likely to have businesses or gas stations open 24 seven. And even though Johnny is approaching the corner of Ashworth and 42nd Street to pick up his papers, the numbered streets here in West Des Moines did not, do not, match up with the numbered streets in Clive, which is where the man said he was headed. It may have been confusing to the stranger, but 86th Street in Clive is actually 22nd Street in West Des Moines. And if he had followed the street numbers in this area, he would have gone the wrong direction. After speaking through the passenger window to Johnny, the driver rightfully makes a U-turn to head east. But either unsatisfied with Johnny's instructions or perhaps untrusting, he pulls over again, this time at Johnny's destination, the newspaper drop-off corner, where there's a group of paper carriers collecting their newspapers. John Rossi is the only adult in this group. As the adult, Mr. Rossi approaches the stranger, who he describes as approximately 40 years old with dark features and a mustache. He looked like he was disgusted, a bit miffed, John said about the man. Additionally, Mr. Rossi rules out the possibility that the driver may have been drunk, instead implying that he may have been heavily caffeinated or even high, as he appeared wide awake and with beady eyes. The man in the blue Ford Fairmont again pulls out onto Ashworth and correctly heads east. While police have searched for this lost driver, no one has ever come forward. Eventually, Mr. Rossi will go under hypnosis to further examine this interaction, and this exercise uncovers at least one digit of the license plate, as well as the fact that it was stamped as being from nearby Warren County. Mike tells Johnny's mom, Noreen, that at this point, Johnny has told him that the driver gives him the creeps. And since he's collected his papers, he begins to walk with his full wagon up this street, 42nd Street. And Johnny must have had some good intuition going. Because for me, hearing this next part, this is where the story does get really creepy. Mike watches as another strange man comes out from this grove of trees. At this time, this man is described as tall. And that's it. I guess it's important to remember that in September, it was still pretty dark and Mike is the only witness around to report seeing what happens next. Mike watches as the man on the road walks, keeping pace behind Johnny. And then he watches as he crosses over to follow Johnny on this sidewalk. Now, Mike, he doesn't know what's about to happen next, so he doesn't follow Johnny up 42nd. He has his own papers to collect and deliver, so no one knows where this man ends up. In fact, the next two witnesses to see Johnny don't see this stranger at all. Two other paper boys are walking down 42nd Street from the north, coming to the newspaper drop-off where Johnny gets his papers. So many of the witnesses are minors. Their names are never printed in the papers. Uh, I've seen them referred to as the Bosun brothers, but I don't have their first names. They report seeing Johnny and his wagon approach the corner here at Marcourt and 42nd. This was the place where Johnny would normally stop and either bag or roll his papers. 
The Bolson brothers reported seeing Johnny walking this way with his wagon and his dog while they went to pick up their papers. By the time that they got their newspapers for their own route and turned back just the one block, Johnny was gone and only his wagon remained. The Associated Press reported that the bundle of newspapers was unbroken, so Johnny wasn't here for very long. The final witness lived just across the street. This person is also a teenager, PJ Smith. He was up early when he heard a car door slam. He looked out the window just in time to see a dark car run the stop sign and turn left. And Johnny's wagon was left there at the corner. PJ reports to the police that this car is another two-toned Ford Fairmont. But PJ says that this one is silver with black along the bottom. So... Initially, media do report that the authorities are looking for two separate vehicles. And over the long course of this case, they can never locate either vehicle. But does anyone else remember this dress? Depending on who you talk to, it's either a blue dress or a white dress. And it was early that morning. It was dark. And so eventually people considered that in certain lighting or at such an angle, The blue appears to be black, or silver, or vice versa, and maybe there is just one Ford Fairmont. Some sources today only reference one car, one driver, who maybe came back one more time after asking for directions as some sort of ruse to get close to Johnny. Who really knows though? So much of this case is like this, unknown conjecture. But I should not get ahead of myself because first, none of the witnesses do anything. PJ does not know that he has just seen the Johnny Gosh abduction. At first, nothing happens. And nothing is exactly what triggers the phone calls. At about 7.45, the residents at Fran Crest Circle wake up and emerge from their homes to find no Sunday paper in their driveways. Johnny has been, up until now, a reliable paperboy, so they do what neighbors do, and they call up his home to see what's going on. Noreen is in the kitchen making breakfast, and assuming that after attempting to do the route all on his own, Johnny is just running behind, John Sr. leaves the home to help out. Suspiciously, Gretchen, the dog, is all alone back in their yard. Then, John Sr. locates the wagon, completely full of newspapers still at the corner of Marquardt and 42nd. As soon as John gets back to the house, he instructs Noreen to call the police. John and a neighbor look for Johnny as they deliver his papers. Noreen calls around to the other paper boys and waits for the police to arrive. Despite her urgent calls, she waits 45 minutes. Due to this wait, Noreen speaks with several of the witnesses prior to the police, and she is able to describe, at least to some extent, the strange interactions Johnny had here that morning. Despite that, the police at the time are not accustomed to stranger abductions, and the responding officer asks Noreen, has your son ever run away before? It must have been heartbreaking and infuriating to hear. It was typical at the time to wait at least 72 hours before investigating a missing person's case unless there was clear evidence of foul play. In the case of Johnny, nothing was clear. Though, to some extent, police do begin to look for him right away. Reports vary, but anywhere from 25 to 40 law enforcement officers are involved in the search that Sunday. On Monday, Labor Day, Law enforcement, Boy Scouts, and about a thousand volunteers searched wooded areas, parks, and abandoned lots for Johnny or evidence in his disappearance. Reports of a large pool of blood at an area coin-operated car wash were made to police, and investigators collected evidence but found that the blood type did not match Johnny. There is an area-wide media appeal for the drivers of either vehicle spotted before the abduction, the blue-on-blue or silver-on-black Ford Fairmonts. The Des Moines Register announces a reward fund of $5,000 for information. It was 
a frantic and scary time for the family. John Gosh Sr. reports not sleeping without word of his son's whereabouts. Noreen describes her state of mind as panic-stricken. She speaks directly to Johnny in interviews with news reporters. She tells him that she loves him. She tells him that they're waiting for him and that they will continue to leave the porch light on until he returns. Every bit of energy they had went into finding Johnny. They wanted so desperately to find him alive. And it made them think very critically about the days leading up to his disappearance. Was there something they missed? Some sort of clue? For several weeks, they had received hang-up calls to the house. Unfortunately, they were not able to be traced, but could those have been related? That previous Friday night, Johnny had attended the Valley Tigers high school football game. He had sat in the crowd with his parents and watched his older half-brother Joe on the field. Joe's father had died of cancer when he was just a baby, and Noreen, his mother, had been introduced to John Gosh Sr. after losing her first husband. They were married, and baby Johnny was born in 1969. They were a supportive family, and the two brothers got along very well. They enjoyed spending time riding dirt bikes together, and Johnny was at the game to cheer on his brother, but on two occasions, he got up from his seat. Not to meet up with his best friend, Aaron. No, Johnny tells his parents on the way home from the game that he was speaking with one of the local policemen working security. He tells his mom about the talkative officer and thinks out loud about pursuing a career in law enforcement. He's only 12 years old, but almost 13, and he's thinking about the future. As he considers patrolling these streets instead of delivering newspapers to them, his mother and father did not consider yet the possibility that the man Johnny had been speaking with at the football game could have been a predator. In hindsight, though, it was a memorable encounter with a strange man. When the composite sketch of the lost person that Johnny talks to looks similar to the policeman working security, Mr. and Mrs. Gosh share this story with the West Des Moines police detective assigned to their case. He arrives to interview them on September 8th, three days after Johnny's abduction. They implore him to look into any members of the police department that may have been working the football game. However, it takes more than two months and a letter to the newspaper before they see photos of all the men working the football game that night. A delay that is difficult for the Goshes to understand. In response, Police Chief Orville Cooney tells register staff writers in early November that he did not know that the Goshes were having a problem getting to see photos of the men. There were a total of 10 officers working the game that night. They've seen all but two of them, and we're going to get Polaroids of those two. In general, the West Des Moines Police Department's investigation leaves a lot to be desired, according to the Goshes. It is the first public sign of friction between the family and the police force. But privately, for weeks, the Goshes had begged police to conduct more physical searches before the winter and snowfall would ruin or obscure any evidence. Johnny's family organized and conducted their own searches. Help and support came from all over. Neighbors, volunteers, various people from their community, all hoping to find Johnny. Johnny's parents asked the chief of police when the FBI would be coming in to look at the case and were told in response, we just really don't have a crime. Nothing to investigate, he implies. No answers for the mother and father that lost their son. They wanted assistance from the FBI and from other law enforcement agencies. However, due to the lack of evidence left at the scene, the FBI declines to investigate. So, Noreen and John turned to other professionals for help. They hired their own private investigators who canvassed their neighborhood for leads. Several neighbors told the Goshes that police had not spoken with them about Johnny's disappearance or followed up on their tips. One woman believed that she had seen Johnny being photographed on his way home from school by a man two weeks before the kidnapping. She had reported it to police with a license plate number However, taking photos was not a crime. The police had not filed a report, and no record of the license plate was kept. 
Additionally, the Gosh's private investigator also found a possible witness that lived on Woodland Avenue. This man was up early getting water from his kitchen on the morning of Johnny's abduction. He had spotted a van outside his house parked along the side of the road. It had been parked facing the wrong direction on the street, and that got this man's attention. Standing at his window, he watched as a blue car pulled up and unloaded something into the van. Both vehicles then turned right north on 42nd Street. The witness reached out to police with their lead, but told the private investigator that no one had gotten back to them yet. The assistance from private investigators appeared to be a worthwhile, though costly, expense. Early on in the investigation, John and Noreen tell reporters that they are paying about $200 a day to the PIs assisting in the search. To pay for this expense, they dipped into their kids' college funds. When that was drained, they sold stickers and candy bars imprinted with the words, Help Find Johnny Gosh on them. The Gosh's do-it-themselves methods were met with some criticisms. Keeping Johnny's name and face in the public eye was a reminder to many that their streets were not safe. It also exposed the family to a long series of unpleasant and deceptive characters, and they became subject to public harassment. Noreen wrote that a woman spat at her daughter, Johnny's half-sister Christy, while she was selling candy bars at the mall. The woman told her that, I would not help your mother find that kid if it was the last thing I ever did. Christy completely fell apart, Noreen recounted. It was the last time any of her kids participated in the fundraisers. When asked if she was embarrassed by selling candy bars, she replied that she was appalled that in this country we don't have something better for missing children. We'll do whatever's necessary to find our boy. So embarrassed? No. Appalled? Yes. Whatever was necessary included printing up posters with their own personal phone number listed. It included traveling to do media interviews and begging lawmakers for police reform. It even included delivering a fake bag of money as ransom for their son's life. More than five long weeks into their torment, on October 13th, the family received a ransom note and a phone call asking for $20,000. Was this finally the answer? The son they'd been waiting for? Or was it a hoax? The caller, with a deep voice and gruff demeanor, threatened to send Johnny's severed hand to his mother in the mail if they did not personally deliver the money he requested. The FBI was not interested in assisting with a response. So Noreen drove in to the dark night with a private investigator crouched in her back seat to a fire hydrant on Forest Avenue. She took a bag containing two blocks of wood and delivered that in place of real cash. I was never so scared in all my life, she later said. Several hours passed before police officers returned the bag of blocks. No one had ever arrived to pick them up. As fall turned into winter and days turned to weeks, the case began to turn cold. Gerald Shanahan, chief of the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation said that they had interviewed 371 people and checked 5,000 silver cars, but came up empty handed. We haven't had a case like this, he said. Usually when there are missing persons, you have something to go on. The most striking thing here is the lack of evidence. One PI, Detective Whelan, gives up, frustrated after eight months. He had gone to great lengths to track down Johnny, investigating a truck driver who claimed to have driven Johnny across state lines, and traveling to New England to look through thousands of seized photographs from a child pornography raid. If he is alive, he's not in the United States, Whelan told reporters. That following spring, a Des Moines Register article stated that in the previous six months, police had checked every all-night establishment in the metropolitan area. Still, there were no good clues as to what happened to Johnny. Leads from more than a dozen psychics had been followed up on, and still, there was no evidence of Johnny. 
Although, very early on, the family had praised police efforts, the public relationship between law enforcement and the Goshes had soured quickly. In a guest article Noreen wrote for USA Today, she chronicled several issues they encountered, specifically with the West Des Moines police chief in charge during the time of Johnny's abduction, Chief Orville Cooney. She called out his alcoholism and ego. Chief Cooney planned to solve Johnny's case without the help of other law enforcement agencies. His hesitation involving the FBI in their case was a source of great frustration. The Goshes were not the only people with complaints about Orville Cooney. Many people had problems with the West Des Moines police chief, including some of his own policemen. Earlier that year, 10 of them had spoken with the Des Moines Register about their concerns. Allegations included verbal harassment of his own officers, drinking on the job, the beating of a handcuffed prisoner, and a compromised burglary investigation that implicated his own son. Chief Cooney denied the allegations, and eventually he retired after having open heart surgery in June of 1983, nine months after Johnny's abduction. By the time a year had passed, the Help Find Johnny Gosh organization had raised $60,000 and worked with 200 psychics. A West Des Moines police sergeant told the Associated Press that they were still receiving calls about the case almost daily and that they had not located anyone that fit the description of the lost driver from that morning when Johnny went missing. In January of 1984, a woman contacted the Goshes about a sighting of Johnny in Oklahoma about 10 months prior. She said a boy ran up to her and said, Please, lady, help me. My name is John David Gosh. Then a man came up, twisted his arm behind his back, and dragged him away. She told private investigators that the local police had shrugged it off as a family situation. Then, in March, investigators in Texas followed up on at least a dozen reported sightings of Johnny in the Southwest. We did have some pretty good leads at that time, we thought, said Detective Guy Genevieve of Corpus Christi. Hope is around every corner, it seems, but answers were always out of reach. Detective McKinney, in charge of the case on the West Des Moines Police Department, said, I've never worked a case this long without having a good, strong feeling about it. Advancement on their case seemed hopeless, but progress in other avenues was being made. John and Noreen, along with the parents of other missing children, including John Walsh, founded the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in June of 1984. Congress had passed the Missing Children's Assistance Act, which would help to fund a 24-hour toll-free hotline and assist in their efforts to prevent child abductions and recover missing children. Ronald Reagan held a ceremony at the White House to celebrate the event. Back home in West Des Moines, Iowa passed the Johnny Gosh Bill, which requires police to act as soon as practicable when a child is reported missing. Noreen and John were there for the signing of the bill that July. Eight other states quickly followed. Federal law now prohibits authorities in any state from creating a waiting period before searching for missing children. Among several complaints Noreen and John had about the West Des Moines Police Department, one was the way his case was classified. Police had filed Johnny's case with the term missing rather than abducted, which changed the way that leads were treated by law enforcement. The Goshes had struggled for months to have Johnny reclassified as abducted, but this change was not made until Eugene was taken. Early in the morning on August 12, 1984, nearly two years after Johnny Gosh disappeared, Eugene Martin got out of his bed on the south side of Des Moines. It was 4.30 in the morning, and he was up early on this Sunday to do his paper route alone. Normally, Gene's older stepbrother did the route with him, but last night his brother had attended a party and wanted to sleep in. Eugene was an active and happy 13-year-old who enjoyed football, fishing, and video games. He was spotted by witnesses between 5.45 and 6.05 in the morning, folding newspapers and talking to a man on the corner 
where his bundle of papers had been delivered. People who saw them talking described it as a friendly, even father-son-like conversation. But just 10 minutes later, by 6.15, his bag was found on the ground with only 10 folded papers in it. Eugene Martin was gone. Reaction from law enforcement was quick this time around. Boom! Just like that, Don Martin, Eugene's father, described the quick accumulation of police cars that filled their street. Within hours, posters with Jean's picture were going up across town. Eugene had been wearing blue jeans, a gray and white midriff shirt with red sleeves, and blue tennis shoes with white diagonal stripes. Unlike Johnny, Eugene's case was immediately considered a kidnapping. After interviewing the witnesses, local authorities issued a nationwide bulletin for a man described as clean-shaven, between 30 and 40 years old, 5 foot 9 inches tall, and a medium build. Herb Hawkins, special FBI agent in charge of the Nebraska-Iowa field office, described the suspect as an introvert, a loner, who may or may not be extra guilt-ridden on what he does, but will not turn himself in. Authorities noted that while there were many similarities between Eugene and Johnny's cases, they could not connect the two conclusively. Eugene's father, Don, suspected that Eugene may have been followed in the weeks leading up to his disappearance due to the fact that it was the first morning he'd been out to deliver papers without his older brother. He told reporters that John and Noreen were helpful sources of support. They know what we're going through now, and they know what we're going to go through. Similar to the Goshes, the Martins also experienced incidents of public harassment. Eugene's mother Janice said, I've had six or seven calls saying things like, if Gene had been home where he belongs, he'd be here today. I didn't know how many strange people there were. Unfortunately, solid leads dry up fast, and within two months, police and 36 volunteers were searching a cornfield south of Ankeny based on the advice of a psychic. Des Moines Police Detective James Rowley told the Register that over the entire course of the investigation into Eugene's case, he had chased down somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 leads, but found not one to be credible. Johnny and Eugene's case are never officially linked. No evidence could be found to tie the two kidnappings to each other. There are many similarities. Victim's age, occupation, the time and approximate location of the crime, and no evidence left at the scene. Even though the cases are not linked, with the abduction of a second newspaper delivery boy, Johnny's case received renewed attention from both the media and law enforcement. The FBI released an age progress photo of Johnny. However, unconvinced by the FBI's likeness of their son, the Goshes released their own image, Johnny with long hair. Before the end of the year, local company Anderson Erickson Dairy began printing Eugene and Johnny's faces and details on the sides of their milk cartons. The campaign aimed to raise awareness of missing children and child abductions. Hundreds of other dairies joined in, distributing an estimated 1.5 billion milk cartons in just six months. Calls to the National Missing Children's Hotline tripled. It is a wonderful success, but at home for the goshes, months pass and the cycle of hope and despair without their son continues. In 1985, a Sioux City, Iowa woman was given a dollar bill as change from a grocery store and written next to George Washington were the words, I am alive. It was signed Johnny Gosh. As soon as the woman saw it, she sought out the family's information. John Sr. remembered receiving her call at 10 p.m. Mr. Gosh sent her a dollar in exchange for it. Three separate handwriting analysts reviewed the bill and determined it to be authentic. Because it had been released into circulation from the Federal Reserve in Minneapolis in July of 1984, the previous year, two years after his abduction, it was seen as a huge sign of hope for the Goshes. 
the Discovery initiated another public plea for Johnny's return. At a press conference in Washington, D.C., John and Noreen offered $400,000 in reward money and were joined by Senators Charles Grassley and Tom Harkin. Organizing a search reaching far beyond the Iowa borders, John and Noreen Gosh have unhappily become experts in the sordid underworld of child kidnappings, sexual abuse, and exploitation, said Senator Grassley. He urged the passage of the Child Victims' Right Act, a bill that included increased penalties for crimes against children and protected children testifying in court cases. Senator Grassley had been working with the Goshes through the Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources. To Senator Grassley, the family submitted their complaints about the law enforcement's response to Johnny's abduction. It was supported by multiple letters from neighbors stating that they were never interviewed by West Des Moines police. Noreen wrote about the agony and desperation of looking for their missing child, and she recounted being told by Jay Howell from the Juvenile Justice Department, Your child would have been better off if he had been kidnapped before he was 10 years old. The family submitted Noreen's USA Today guest column, where she wrote, in this country, we have foundations to save baby seals, whales, and battleships, but there's no help for missing children and their parents. It is the burden of the parents alone. Getting her son's case out in the public eye was making progress politically. Wonderful changes were being made to advance children's rights nationwide. But again, the publicity was exposing the family to unpleasant and deceptive characters. Robert Herman Meyer II, a teenager from Michigan, had told the Goshes that he was a member of the Hells Angels motorcycle gang named Dakota. He said that the gang had taken Johnny to Mexico, where he had been sold into slavery. He said in return for $11,000, he would be able to rescue him. Due to this elaborate story, and accurate description of Johnny's birthmarks, John and Noreen paid him the money and agreed to wire another $100,000 to a Bahamian bank account upon the safe return of their son. However, Johnny wasn't returned home safely, and authorities found Robert fleeing north into Canada with his family. During a court appearance, Robert Meyer told the judge that his story was false. His defense attorney said that he admitted to making up only parts of the story, but could not say which claims Robert still maintained were true. The FBI believed that there was no validity to Meyer's claims, and he pled guilty in October of 1985 to two counts of wire fraud and a plea bargain arrangement. In their quest to champion policy change for missing children across the United States and raise awareness about their own son, the Goshes met the parents of many other missing children. Noreen met the mother of Michaela Garrett, Sharon Murch, on the set of Lisa during the recording of an episode on child abductions. Michaela had been kidnapped from Hayward, California in 1988. After discussing the cases backstage, Sharon and Noreen concluded that the predator descriptions matched both suspects were described as tall and with facial acne. On the basis of these shared similarities, Noreen began sharing the suspect sketches from Michaela's case in California as drawings of the suspect in her own son's case. She labels the suspect Tony and describes him as the man that followed behind Johnny on foot, one that used a stun gun to subdue him. For years now, the Goshes were accustomed to following their own leads and taking their own initiatives to advance Johnny's case. However, in the end, Michaela and Johnny's cases are not actually related. Many years later, in December of 2020, Michaela's death is linked via DNA to David Mish. He has a prior felony conviction, assault with a deadly weapon, a conviction that occurred in California in 1982, making it impossible for him to be involved in Johnny's case. David is not Tony. 
So many various leads are pursued and so many do not pan out. What is real and what is possible becomes very muddled in this case, especially as time passes further. In 1986, a pedophile associated with the local newspaper delivery was uncovered. At first, Wilbur Milhouse seemed like a really good suspect. He had worked for the Des Moines Register, recruiting and managing newspaper carriers until 1983. His home was searched after two teenaged boys accused him of sexual abuse and a sexually explicit phone call was traced to him. Police had recovered the names and phone numbers of hundreds of boys in Milhouse's home. But as the investigation continued, law enforcement did not find any evidence associated with the kidnapped boys. Police Lieutenant Marvin Brewer told reporters, nothing at this time indicated a connection to the possible abductions of Johnny Gosh or Eugene Martin. The next big news in the case comes in 1989 when the Goshes learn about Paul Benassi. Paul Benassi is a young man serving time in Lincoln, Nebraska for sexual abuse. He had been diagnosed with multiple personality disorder and had been indicted for perjury by a grand jury in Omaha for his accusations of sexual abuse in the Franklin Community Credit Union scandal. However, those charges had been dropped. Paul appeared to be both a victim and a perpetrator of sexual abuse. He had kept several diaries and at some point gives his attorney information indicating that he had participated in the abduction of a Des Moines paper boy. John DeCamp, Bonacci's attorney, determined the boy to be Johnny and contacted the family who decided to meet with Paul. Paul tells first John and then Noreen that he wrestled Johnny into the back of the car driven by a man named Emilio. He draws a map and correctly identifies the abduction point. He correctly identifies the location of the second vehicle, the van, spotted parked in the wrong direction that morning, something uncovered by their PI that had not yet been shared by the press. And he tells the Goshes that they rode in that van to a home in Sioux City, where Johnny was kept for several days. Paul tells Johnny's family that Johnny used yoga to meditate, something Johnny and Noreen used to do together. The Goshes believed Paul's account of the abduction and asked the police department to interview Paul to investigate his claims. However, they speak with Paul's siblings instead, who tell authorities that Paul was in Omaha that Sunday before Labor Day in 1982. Though it is now nine years later, and due to the short driving distance possible that Paul could have been in both locations on a single day, the West Des Moines Police Department choose not to interview Paul Bonacci. In 1991, Paul talks to WHO Channel 13 News and speaks with Noreen in front of news cameras. He tells the story of Johnny's abduction after summoning an apparent alter ego. I was just supposed to hold this person down in the back of the car and put the stuff over his face, he describes it simply. The motivation behind Johnny's abduction was to create child pornography. Paul says, I feel so bad about it because of what they made me do, he tells Noreen. After years and years of hope, hoaxes, and false leads, many find it hard to believe that the Goshes have found the truth. Paul's credibility is low, and his claims seemed even more outlandish than the Hells Angels gang member who claimed to have sold Johnny in Mexico. But Paul continues to convince the members of the media who choose to interview him. In 1992, America's Most Wanted aired a clip of Paul discussing what happened to Johnny. He described how some kidnapped kids were marked with a brand on their skin, and corroborating victims called into the producers sharing similar stories, showing them their brands. When America's Most Wanted traveled to Colorado with Paul to find a house that he had been held captive in, Paul breaks down in tears. The home is, as he had described, with a hidden chamber dug out underneath. There are initials carved into the wood. Unfortunately, 
the home in Colorado is abandoned and efforts to locate previous owners or tie them to any crimes are fruitless. The Goshes still hope Emilio can be found and brought to justice without the assistance of law enforcement. Nearly eight years later, in 1999, Noreen travels to federal court in Lincoln, Nebraska, where trials for Paul Benassi and Larry King of the Franklin Credit Union are ongoing. While on the witness stand, a judge asks Noreen if she had seen or talked to Johnny since his abduction in 1982. In a shocking revelation, she replies, once. I saw my son once. It was a secret she had held on to for two years. Johnny had arrived on her doorstep one night, but asked her to tell no one. There was no warning of his arrival. She said he showed up and they spoke for about an hour or an hour and a half. Many years later, Noreen told KWWL News that the night that he came here, he was wearing jeans and a shirt and a coat on because it was March. It was cold and his hair was long. It was shoulder length and it was straight and dyed black. She recognized him immediately and they talked and talked before Johnny told her that he had to go. Because John and Noreen had divorced in 1993, she no longer lived here on the cul-de-sac on 45th Street, and John was not there to meet his son or verify her story. It seems so unlikely that Johnny would return to see his mother but not stay. However, it would not be the first time a kidnapping victim returned to their family but only for a short visit. Colleen Stan had been kidnapped in 1977 and kept locked in a box for years. She saw her family in 1981, four years into her abduction and torture, but lied to them out of fear and stayed for only a short while. Still, many people, even Mr. Gosh, were skeptical of the story of Johnny's visit. John Sr. told the Des Moines Register reporter Frank Santiago, Apparently, she's trying to get more publicity, or whatever, to get on a talk show so she could go where it's warm. Noreen responded, I don't care. I was under oath and I told the truth. West Des Moines Police Sergeant Steve Hoffman said about Johnny's visit to his mother, We really don't know any more at this time than what anybody else knows. We will talk to her and investigate anything that appears to need investigation. I'm sure if I were in her shoes, I'd be under a lot of stress. From our perspective, there's never been any hard evidence to point in any direction. Never any hard evidence is right. Since that very first day, Sunday, September 5th, 1982, this case has seen very little in the way of hard evidence. Was that dollar bill from 1985 really signed by Johnny? If the handwriting experts still believed it was, maybe so. But what about the sighting in Oklahoma? What about Benassi? Noreen wrote a book titled Why Johnny Can't Come Home. It was published in the year 2000 and tells her story of what she believes happened to her son. It is reassuring to me that after all of these years of hoping and hoaxes, of false leads and deception, that for her, some of the not knowing has gone away. In 2006, a number of photos of young boys tied up were delivered suspiciously to Noreen. Looking closely at the captive boys, she believed some could have been Johnny, but John Sr. did not. Authorities turned up a detective from Florida who recognized some of the photographs. He believed that he could identify several of the boys from a case he had worked many years prior, but he wasn't sure about all of the images. There is still so much uncertainty, so much unknown. Today, many things are so different compared to 40 years ago. News is delivered straight to your phone, not your driveway, and no one can imagine waiting days to investigate a missing child. Some things do remain the same. Still today, there is no hard evidence and very few clues as to the whereabouts 
of missing person Johnny Gosh. <laughs>